to say they were your mentor, but he was my research assistant um, and, and uh, mentee. Uh, but Levon, after getting his MBA here, and that's one reason I was so happy he flew all the way from Moscow to see you. Um, I, I, I like what I call you can get there from here, that you as an Emory MBA can, can become a great success, and, but I wanted someone to share some secrets. Anyway, Levon grew up in uh, the capital of the Republic of Georgia, Tbilisi, went to their finest university, uh, Tbilisi State University, and he's a, uh, is it a geophysicist? So he is a scientist, many of you come from a scientific or engineering background. Um, as well as being a scientist, he was a great athlete. He was on their national rugby team and then even played pro for a little while. And he had the exciting position, what's called a winger. He was the one, the fastest person, they, they, they get the ball in the scrum and they throw it out to him and he tries to score or he gets cream. Um, <laughs> uh, so I just want to make one more point about the athlete he is and then move on very quickly to his professional uh, um, success and, and his ties to Emory. This is something that's going to surprise you, but I can do 20 one-arm push-ups. I don't know if any of you have done one-arm push-ups. Don't make me prove it. But I probably wouldn't want to have a good competition. Where's Dan or, or with you or something? But, uh, so I was showing off for Levon when he was my researcher. He said, I can do like 25 of them. And he showed me something I've never seen. So he does a push-up, but he can push so high and hold his body so strong does a push-up while he's up, claps behind his back, and he still hasn't face-planted. <laughs> then he claps in front, then he puts his hands down the first step. And I said, you better get that one right, and I never tried it. <laughs> or I wouldn't look like this. I would look, you know. All right, so he goes um, to, to Moscow, even though, like I said, he's Georgian, um, and he uh, becomes a success with a large, maybe one of the largest conglomerates in, in uh, Russia. And they, uh, and he's kind of first vice president, kind of like a chief operating officer and the strategist. Then they floated on the London Stock Exchange, which was very unusual, maybe uh, um, noteworthy for a Russian conglomerate. It was a great success. But then he wanted to run uh, an operating unit himself and be a CEO so he could get that hands on experience. So he ran uh, one of the world's large insurance companies, Rosnoff, and then sold that to the, the really big one, Allianz, you've all heard of Allianz of Germany, with a huge return on that. Uh, and that was some capital and some stomach for risk. He's become a very successful entrepreneur. He can probably tell you some about that. But when he tells you about just a piece of what he's doing, the pet business, it's basically pet smart, the largest uh, pet food and pet, uh, pet products company in Russia, as well as like the Pets.com, the, the online stuff. So you might think, it sounds like he's been successful. What he's done also is he started a, a, um, a program, a, a charitable program, where successful alums give money for scholarships for all of you. He called it the Give Back Program, to give something back to his weight, and he's challenged others to do it, to multiply his, uh, his generosity. So some of you are here because of him. So give him a hand. Uh, what an introduction. I don't even know how to stand up for it. And um, thank you, Jeff. It's, it's an honor and privilege and pleasure. It's been 20 years um, since I've entered this very school and uh, sitting where you are sitting in a smaller building. We didn't have this great, wonderful business school building. That was before Roberto Goizueta gave, was it, $10 million? Forty. $40 million <laughs> of his own cash and spoke to our class. And, you know, life flies like one day. And I, I'd never think I'd be standing up here and speaking to, to the class. Uh, Jeff introduced me with such great uh, sort of introduction that uh, I'm, I'm very humbled and very uh, honored to be here. And um, what I'll do today is, this is my sixth time doing something like this. I've spoken to this class a few years ago. Then there was uh, Emory Executive uh, MBA group. Something like 100 uh, people came to Moscow and I had a meeting with them. And I've spoken to a couple of other uh, elite uh, political sciences and uh, 
sciences uh, students and every time you do this you try to build on the experience and do something different and today I'm going to spare you from many slides and uh, I'm going to do it in a much more interactive way and I'll reconcile this with, with Jeff and what I want to do is give you a, a 10 minute rundown on the basic skeleton of, of what I've done over the last 20 years ever since maybe even start before the business school and just walk you through it really quickly and maybe draw some of the key points on the board and then see what you like and you can press any of these buttons and tell me to to inflate those and comment on them because you know it's one thing to be standing here and be telling you you know how to try to achieve success after you graduate how to make most money you can how to advance in your careers but it's another thing to try to put everything in a broader context because a lot of you are you know who are graduating in May are very focused and centered and energetic around I'm sure getting your jobs and building your careers further and when I was in your shoes my main goal was was how to do that how to achieve success how to make money how to how to be the the, the businessman and every speaker who came to speak to us uh, largely thanks to Jeff's phenomenal connection base and interest in people we've had Don Keo speak to us we've had Roberto Goizueta we've had the, the, the Prime Minister of Jamaica Michael Manley uh, speak to us everyone sat in the room trying to grab what was important for him or her and apply it to, to his to project onto his life and you're gonna do that today so my role today is to minimize bragging as much as I can and uh, and you know help you in any way I can when you move forward but before I begin I want to say something maybe unorthodox your successes and your achievements will come faster and easier than you think and that you know that is not to say any one of you has to be laid back and uh, not work very hard about achieving them. And but my experience has shown me that it's not the the result that matters. It's what you do after you achieve the result. Because the result is like a horizon. It's a moving target. It always moves away from you. And you know you dream about. Uh, six-figure salary when you graduate then you dream about your first million dollars then you dream about your first ten million dollars and as you go achieving these steps in your life you turn back and you realize that you're always in this constant hunt and you're never satisfied and I think and that's why I called my today's presentation battle for balance and I only have five slides five slides and I will talk about uh, the importance of balance in, in your life which is much more prevailing and much more grand and important than individual goals you will be achieving when you graduate this school. What I'm going to do here is uh, start by introducing my, my friends who are here. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have uh, Zaza Pachulia, one of the world's greatest basketball players at the Center for Atlanta Hopes sitting here in the in the row so please give him a hand <laughs> you, you realize uh, as a as a you know for me as a Georgian man to see um, uh, my compatriot succeed in such a great sport I don't know how many hundreds of millions of people play basketball in the world and only 400 of them make it to the National Basketball Association and uh, uh, only 250 of them really play full time and Zaza is one of them and a great story of a young kid who, who lost his father when he was 14 and uh, moved to Turkey to play basketball and, and then was drafted in the NBA at the age of 19 and with the NBA players averaging five years in the in the NBA has gone for 10 years by now and I was about to attend uh, his game yesterday but he, he ripped his uh, Achilles and uh, 
it's a first injury of its kind and he's six months off the court and sort of watching him cope with the injury and talking about his success and talking about the incredible amount of hard work he's putting in uh, and realizing that no matter what you do, whether you're a businessman or a great athlete like Zaza, uh, the, the recipe for, for happy life, and let's talk about that later, is not that different, it has been a great joy. Uh, one of my, another one of my great mentors and teachers, Dr. Ken Walker, is here. He is one of the leaders of uh, Emory's medical practices, and God knows how many Georgian students have benefited from his hospitality. And, and generosity, and I'm very thankful for Ken to be here. And last but not least, my fellow MBA, South African Italian, Marco Piovesan is sitting in the back. Uh, Marco and I graduated together. We shared passion as a South African and Georgian. We shared passion for rugby and uh, played each other a couple of times, and I'm very happy to have him here. And Zaza, Rock this ball for Jeff and uh, I'll let it out of Say my phone. <laughs> Communism, uh, U.S. was something on the Mars for us. Um, as a Georgian, I was always, uh, I was raised in the culture which we believed to be occupied by the Russians. You know, with many years after that, we, 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 we cope with this legacy, but my culture is as alien to, to Russian culture as yours. We have very big bonds and fondness with each other, both Christian nations. Very difficult love and hate relationships, and that's how I was raised. Uh, went to school, graduated, Jeff mentioned Tbilisi State University. I got out in 92, and I thought I was going to be a scientist for the rest of my life, a geophysicist. Uh, this is about time hell broke loose and Soviet Union collapsed. There was no room, no space for applied sciences. If I wanted to remain a scientist and feed my family, I'd have to move permanently to one of the Western countries and, and live there for long. Uh, Civil War, my house burned down, 1990, 1991. My house burned down in the middle of Tbilisi. Our family lost everything. And this is back when Mikhail Gorbachev was running Soviet Union. And I became one of the first Soviet students to be sent to the United States for my education as a geophysicist. Then I went back home. Then Soviet Union collapsed. I graduated. My house burned down. 1993, I decided to go abroad again and uh, pretty much save my life and save my career. And that's when I ended up at this great school. I was extremely lucky they gave me scholarship because I had nothing. And uh, Ken gave me his home to stay. Uh, and I studied here and um, I look back at this as one of the best experiences of my life. 95, I graduated with two offers, one in New York with a think tank which did business in Eastern Europe, one here in Coca-Cola, and one small investment bank in Moscow, boutique. So I didn't know what to do. I agonized for about two weeks and decided I wanted to go back, you know, not quite home because Russia was never my home, but closer to home. So I go to Moscow as an investment banker. As it often happens with uh, many MBAs, I bounce around among a couple of jobs in my first two or three years. As an investment banker, 
and in 1998, I'm invited to join Sistema, which is sixth largest business in Russia now. If you subtract uh, Mr. Putin's controlled state companies like Gazprom and Russian railroads, it's probably number four. It's a $30 billion company. We have 130,000 people working for us there now. And uh, I joined as one of 22 deputies to the CEO. A very embryonic, poorly organized conglomerate with lots of assets. Some of them privatized through privatization auctions from the Soviet or post-Soviet government. Some of them entrepreneurial startups which the company bought. And I'm under the CEO helping deal with this. Uh, a year later, actually a year and a half later, I become his first deputy. And I basically run uh, the strategy group. Uh, I, I sit on the boards of 14 large Sistema companies and I help our CEOs uh, run their businesses. Anything from business planning to organizational restructuring to M&A to taking them public to spinning them off, we can dwell into those uh, in a greater detail. That takes me almost 10 years, 2007. Before that, as Jeff mentioned, in 05, we take this baby public, which was a monumental job because you know how it is with conglomerates, stock markets don't like them, especially if they're from the BRIC countries. How do you explain to a fidelity uh, analyst in Boston what is Sistema, you know, with so many businesses? Nonetheless, we did it. It was a great success. Uh, it was a bigger IPO than all Russian IPOs by that time on the London Stock Exchange combined. And uh, after this point in time, I kind of started getting, I don't want to say bored, but unmotivated because I felt like I've done everything I could at the, at the top of the group. So I've asked Vladimir to put me down to run one of our businesses, I became the CEO of one of the businesses which I chaired before, which we sold to Allianz. This is Rosnan sold to Allianz. At this time I was a shareholder both at Sistema and Rosnan, and I had this choice of cashing in my chips and leaving the group or staying at Sistema. Vladimir's proposal was I stay and I run another Sistema division. Um, I don't know what prompted me uh, to leave, but I always had this entrepreneurial bug or drive. I wanted to be on my own. So to my surprise, in a way, I said to Vladimir, um, thank you very much, I'm on my own now. Took a year off. And pretty much done nothing but be with wife and kids. How Just many kids? Nino and I have seven children. That's <laughs> life balance. <laughs> <laughs> or a hard working wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so just one year with Nino and kids. Back then we had five kids. Then the war happened between... <laughs> They're thinking you make good use of the time. <laughs> uh, Nino and I... Then the war happens between... Then the war happens between Russia and Georgia, which is one of the great tragedies, tragedies of my life, because I'm a big fan of both cultures. One is my home, the other one is almost my home. And to see the political uh, decay go as deep as the military confrontation has been, has been a tragedy for all of us. And um, I decided to move the family to, to England because um, I couldn't bring myself to have them live in Moscow. And I, I needed a place from which I could operate freely and travel. So, 08. Oh, 09, year and a half pretty much in London, 
kids go to school there, everything's good, but we miss home. And more importantly, being from one of the most ancient and authentic and generic cultures in the world with its own alphabet and language unrelated to anything you've heard before, we wanted the kids to grow up in their home culture. So Nino and I said, let's go back home. So ever since 2009, the family has been back in Georgia. We've built a school where our children study and a lot of our friends' children study. And it's 2013, I'm standing before you. I kind of diverged from, from the career path into the family path right here. So let me go back to it. In 08, while back in London, we started Prometheus Capital Partners, which is, uh, which is a private equity firm uh, among uh, three of us. I'm the main sort of founder and shareholder. I have two other partners. Um, we started looking, this was the peak of the Russian crisis. Russian stock market lost 95% at some point. So I was really lucky to have left Sistema because mm -hmm. I, I cashed in my Sistema shares around here and 10 months later they lost 95%. And although by now they're almost back to their original level, I don't think I would have survived it. I would have had a heart attack <laughs> and died. <laughs> uh, okay, so. What does Prometheus Capital Partners do? We started looking, we, we realized that raising a fund would take forever, especially in the crisis, especially for Russia. So, uh, you know, while we went around the world and I had 200 meetings with the investors from Tokyo to San Francisco over the course of two years, uh, we decided not to wait and use our own capital, whatever we had, to buy a company and fix it up and make it pretty. So we analyzed 40 deals, actually 41 deals. Uh, term sheets, due diligence, hired analysts, negotiated, and picked one. I wanted to pick something that was a home run, and I think we did. And we wanted something very crisis resistant because we were very scared. And I ran some global beta analysis, as you call it, on GDP's correlation to sales. And I found out that pet retail business is one of the most crisis resistant businesses in the world because people feed their pets whatever happens. <laughs> and and uh, even, if you, even if you don't want to feed your pet like you did, before the crisis, guess what? Your pet will not switch to your leftover spaghetti uh, if you try to. So I looked at the map of Russian pet business and it was very nascent and embryonic. We had three companies, very weak and sort of startups, and I called them all in one room, about $30 million each in business in terms of sales. I called them all in one room and I said, I want to buy you out and merge all three companies. One of them fell out during negotiations, so I bought two companies. We bought two companies and merged them into one and created uh, what is now Russia's largest pet retail business. It's not U.S. scale yet, but, you know, we got a hundred million dollar company, which is growing about 40 percent a year. Uh, we had about 80,000 square feet in trading space when we bought it. It's close to 200 now. And uh, we have about 53 big supermarkets uh, in Moscow and different Russian cities. Not a week goes by that we don't approve opening of open up. Uh, I worked very hard to put in uh, modern management systems and IT systems into this business from scratch because the, the startups that we bought were had pretty much maxed out in terms of their uh, uh, platform capacity and we had to do something if we wanted to grow further. So now uh, that business is doing very well. We can talk about it in greater detail. 
And we also bought a big winery in Georgia. Uh, we bought it because Russia banned in 2006, you may remember Russia banned Georgian wine products and all sorts of Georgian products to be sold in Russia. And a U.S. private equity fund which owned the winery got scared because they had about two-thirds of their sales in Russia and it, they collapsed on them. And everyone was in great panic. There were reports in the press about the pretty much death of Georgian agribusiness and, and wine business. And uh, for us, that was the clear signal to, to buy and do something about it. And this May, uh, Georgia finally negotiated the reopening of Russian markets. And this May, we're shipping our first wine products back, back to Russia. In addition to that, out of uh, uh, spare time and capacity and I'd say boredom, we started a couple of other enterprises and companies that I can tell you in detail about. And uh, my heart is in the school which we've built and I spend a lot of time. Uh, right now I, I split my time, I chair the board of our pet retail company, I chair the board of our winery, and uh, I spend a lot of time helping build the school. I spend uh, something like 30% of my daytime with children and, and teachers. And I can start talking about the school and go on for 10 hours nonstop. So try to stop me. And so if you want to hear about the school, I'll be very happy to tell you about it. Um, where do I go from here? I don't know because most of the, the, the cash I made is burned by now, invested in, di <laughs> invested in different enterprises, and it's scary, you know, sometimes uh, you look at it and you say, will these things really grow and will this happen? Um, so yeah, this is my run through, it's been 15 or 20 minutes I've been doing it, so please ask me questions and let's take it from here, go ahead, please. Right. Um, I don't keep my money in Cyprus, thank God. A lot of Russians do. 25, 25 or so billion dollars worth of cash sitting. It's terrible. Uh, what can I say? I think uh, it's irreversible. They're going to shave off a lot of cash from the customers. Uh, it's, um, in a way, it's healthy for Russia to the extent people start to stop shipping so much cash abroad and keep it in Russia. But I'm afraid that's not the conclusion they're going to come to. They're not going to say, I was wrong to take money out of my home country and put it somewhere else. I was wrong to put it in Cyprus, they're going to say. And they're going to go to Liechtenstein and, uh, and Luxembourg and the Mauritius Islands and some such places. I don't know if I've answered your, yeah, your question. You but yeah, please. Uh, I know you mentioned that use kind of your own capital because you want to make quick investments when you saw the opportunity. Uh, long term, would you consider raising foreign capital? And can you talk about kind of what the perspective is on foreign investors when they're considering investing in Russia? Excellent question. Thank you for bringing me back to the, to the subject. We stopped raising the fund because at some point we had some success. EBRD gave us, European Bank for Reconstruction Development, gave us $50 million in anchor financing. Uh, ADVEC, a big Swiss firm out of uh, Geneva, gave us 25 million euros. That, together with our own capital, was enough to raise a small fund. We wanted to do a $350 million fund. Uh, but our initial deal with the investors was fair, was that whatever we buy uh, in the meantime with our own capital, we're not going to negotiate with investors. We're just going to put it into the fund at cost. And because the fundraising process dragged out so long, we got greedy. Because after all the hard work we, we did for the pet retail company, we felt like it was almost thrice the value a year later. And instead of going through the ugly negotiation process with the investors and trying to make money on them, we said, 
and we we were smart enough to warn them warn them in the uh, up front that this may happen and this is very important actually in your careers you need to you know look two or three steps ahead and always take pre precautions and plant your apologies wherever you can because the last thing you want is 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 to ruin your reputation and so we went back to the investors and we said guys remember we said if this goes to for too long, it's not going to be worth it. Uh, we're not going to raise the fund. And so we took the million and a, and a half dollars worth of legal documentation we've bought by then in raising the fund and put it in the refrigerator. And we said, we're going to come back to you after we sell this. Uh, and uh, in general, Russian... Um, investment or private equity business is very embryonic and very dynamic unlike for example in the uk uh 40 percent of m a is done by pe funds uh in 2007 uh, ernst and young did a, did a study on russia and uh, and found out that only two percent of russian m a was done by foreign funds and and so the question is who does the rest of it and the answer is the Kremlin Corporation or the government-controlled giant uh, conglomerates do you know, the, the, big, you know, the, big, the big part. Then you have the likes of Sistema, which really control a big part of the economy. And, you know, smaller versions of Sistema that you've never heard of. I, I'm still amazed, you know, Moscow has more billionaires than New York now. For a few years and I'm still amazed by the city because uh, I keep meeting people that I've never heard of and they introduce them to me and tell me he's a billionaire and I've never seen the guy that's that's <laughs> Moscow and so uh, <laughs> and so you know another interesting question is you know why is you know why is uh, uh, foreign private equity is so small in, a, in BRIC countries in general, especially in Russia. And uh, it has to do with a lot of peculiarities of deal, deal doing in Moscow, and we can talk about it in more detail. More questions, please. When people ask questions, you can kind of say your name and where you're from if you feel like it. And if you want to run a business someday, definitely say your name. Maybe we'll buy one for you. <laughs> I have a question. Um, let's say someone is sitting in this audience like you and Marco did. And Marco's become a great success himself in, in private equity, and, but first large corporations where he worked. Um, if I was a, one of the students, um, what type of person would do well in something like STEM? You know, should go into a large corporation, the Coca-Colas. What first type of person should think, I could make it as an entrepreneur? start Prometheus and start other things. Um, uh, give them some idea of, and also you've hired, I think, someone that went to this MBA program, who's now one of your junior partners. Talk a little bit about the type of, even internal as well as uh, intellectual and emotional intelligence you think could do well in those settings. Um, great question. No, uh, I think rule number one, no universal recipe and no one magic description of an ideal Michael Jordan who would beat everyone. In general, um, corporate life, as you know, it is, is very political. And I've suffered from it because I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a bit of a politician myself, but uh, I'm not a big fan of corridor intrigues and uh, uh, you know, who smiled how and who laughed at whose joke. And, I think it was one of my my signature or handwritings at Sistema. I, I just because I knew I wasn't good at it, I hardly paid any attention to it. So I was a bit of a nutcase in corporate life. Always said what he thought, and and uh, people always thought I'd break my neck. And I think it was Vladimir's goodwill. He wanted to see the the transformation in this gigantic Russian company happen. And I was one of the first uh, local yet U.S. trained MBAs in the country. And so I possessed a, a set of skills that were hard to come by. And so it was a combination, right place, right time, as you, as, as you would call it. Uh, entrepreneurial life is, is completely different. A large company, when you work for it, 
uh, entrenches you and uh, institutionalizes you in a way that uh, you, you, you become psychologically partially enslaved. When you, when you think about leaving it, especially a place like Sistema, we had, when I wanted to travel, the president of Russia's biggest uh, travel services company called Interest was called, would call me and plan my vacation. And same went for insurance and my telephony. Uh, and uh, real estate construction, everything was done in-house. And so when you leave a place like, you, you, for example, if you work for Coca-Cola for a long time and you think about going off and uh, doing something on your own, let me just uh, open that slide. You have to be a little crazy to do it. Uh, these five factors I've put here are very important, but the one in the middle is, is the key, the ambition. The ambition has a bit of a negative cliché to it, and I don't, I don't like it. It's, it's alien to my culture, for example, where humbleness and uh, uh, being reserved is, is a virtue and the ambition is something people don't like, but you have to be driven to do it. But the other four factors, for me, were important. I was secure financially. I, had, I thought I had the mental confidence. I had a very concrete plan as to what to do. I told Zaza this morning that I didn't know uh, how to do it, but I, know, I knew I wanted to be a player in private equity. That was a given. And uh, I had a humongous network uh, in, in former Soviet Union. So all of these pieces came together. But these four peripheral blocks, no matter how great they are for you at any time, in your life will mean nothing to you without the one in the center. If you're not crazy, you're not going to be an entrepreneur. Yeah? And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't know if I've managed to answer your question, Jim, but that's my best shot. Ken. Tell them about you and cement workers and get them all together. Yeah, that was my first deal. There's a big company out of France called Lafarge. You may have heard of it. It's the world's largest construction materials business and the second largest cement company in the world. And, uh, and I was working as an investment banker. I brought Lafarge into Russia. They were my client. And when we started uh, analyzing the industry, I built this, as a geophysicist, I, I like models. And I built this uh, model of Russia's cement industry and realized something terrible. Um, uh, the Soviets have built cement factories based purely on geological considerations. Basically, a anywhere they find a limestone uh, layer, they build a factory. And they didn't care about the market marketing side of the business because the petrol costs were artificially controlled. And you could travel, you could drag cement for 2,000 kilometers, whereas uh, anywhere in the world, the standard radius for cement supply is maximum 250, 300 kilometers. So when the Soviet U Union broke up and uh, the fuel prices went to market, uh, uh, Russians woke up in a situation with humongous excess capacity clusters too close to each other, strangling and suffocating each other. And you could, you could literally see the dynamic of dying, Russia's dying cement business by projecting you know, how long these factories would hold out against each other. And you needed to, Russia had, I think, close to 80 some big cement factories, and you needed to figure out a proper target so that when you bought it, when the battle was over, it was left uh, standing. So we found one near Moscow. And I went negotiating with the, the factory workers. And that was an epic story within itself. But most importantly, when we landed the deal, there was no way to do it uh, in a civilized way. So I actually ended up driving down there with a minivan full of cash to, <laughs> <laughs> to buy. And I arrived on the factory scene with the minivan and one bodyguard and, uh, <laughs> Only one <body> <laughs> and bought the factory. True story. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
We didn't teach you that here. <laughs> Please. Um, can you think of any like specific takeaways or like classes, lessons learned while you were here at Emory Perfect. that you still use today? Perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, MBA was a little too early. I was blessed with it, but I was only 23. And I, I've never worked in business before. I was a kid out of Soviet Union, geophysicist. You know, what did I know? And so I guess the relevance of what was taught to me here was much greater in every single direction than to some of you who've worked in the business, of, you know, been in marketing or accounting or finance and, and came here to just beef up and upgrade your, your capacities. Um, when you're in the program, you try to to memorize everything, that's, at least that's what I did. When you leave, you find out that a lot of your knowledge is too deep in some cases. The level of uh, uh, sort of detail and sophistication in some of the case study analysis you do in your cor corporate finance may not be necessarily needed in your jobs, depending on the job you take. But on the other hand, in some fields, you find it, it's the other way around. For me, uh, Jeff, I don't, I'm not saying this because Jeff is sitting here. Jeff's class was one of my favorites because it, uh, you know, unlike the specific classes, the financial accounting, the management accounting, this, this one here broadens your thinking and lets you, lets you sort of think of the business world in its global perspective. And, and Jeff has been, aside from being my mentor for many years, has been, Marco and I were talking about it, uh, has been my only link, with all due respect to my other professors, to this business school. 10 years, 20 years from now, you're going to look back and when someone tells you, what's GBS for you, Jeffrey Rosenzweig's uh, face will pop into your mind. <laughs> <laughs> And it will not have aged at all. <laughs> you look at <laughs> you look at photographs of me and Jeff and Marco standing 20 years back. The only guy you can recognize from those photographs is, is, is this guy. Uh, Patrick Noonan's class, I don't know if he still teaches it, was one of my favorites because I was very uh, chaotic. Uh, uh, how should I say this, pagans would say Sagittarius about my way of thinking about problems and Patrick helped me organize and I've, believe it or not, I've built these damn trees, decision making <laughs> <laughs> in, in real life and I tried to assess the probabilities and made my decisions based on, based on that. For those of you uh, who are interested in marketing, I think Emory was great back then and now it's one of the, the great schools. So I don't know if I've managed to answer your question, but uh, please, Andre. So you had a very successful career, obviously. Uh, looking back, what do you think you would do differently if you had been in the beginning of your career? Uh, great question, too. I think. Sometimes it's, it's very hard. The grass is always greener, and so you want, you want. Sometimes when I think about this, I regret everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the only one wish I have is to have bought the ticket and landed in Moscow right around here. Uh, because I, I always felt like uh, I was, you know, three or four years late in the game with, the, with the, the guys who had uh, nothing but the right place, right time. Um, point one. Point two, but I understand how ridiculous this notion is. You, you, know, you never know how your life would have worked out. Uh, right after I uh, left Sistema, I got job offers that if anyone told me I would ever turn down, I'd never believe it. Like Steve Schwartzman, the founder of, uh, of uh, 
Blackstone calls Ron Zomer, who is, uh, is uh, ex-CEO of Deutsche Telekom and a good friend of mine. He's a board member at Blackstone and is a board member at Sistema. And uh, you walk around the street in Germany with Ron and everyone recognizes him, sort of like Zaza in Atlanta yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere we went from parking lot people to a restaurant, everyone knows the guy. And so Steve called Ron and asked who should be the chairman of Blackstone in former Soviet Union and Ron said Levan just left and Tony James who's the CEO of Blackstone flew in to see me. And I was coming on the back of 10 years for working on, uh, for a gigantic company. And I said to Tony, I said, you will, you know, if someone told me that I'd be turning down a Blackstone offer to run your business in this great part of the world, I'd never believe it. But let's just be friends and I'll do deals and show you deals and maybe you'll co-invest with me. Do I regret it? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 uh, and no, because I would not have done the pet retail business. If I joined Blackstone, I'd be a Blackstone guy. Um, it's not a matter of, you know, how much you make, always important. But, but I think if Tony was to come back to me, and if you know him, drop him an email, please, for me. And, and offer me this, this now. Now that uh, the pet retail company is ready, and ticking away and working, you know, I'd take the job. But, but life never works this way. You know, you always have to pick your options, please. Uh, so what are your thoughts on a career in emerging markets? I know you haven't worked in the developed markets too much, but what are some of the risks? Like, you know, benefits are there, obviously. There's a lot of growth, but what are some of the risks? I, I'd strongly advise everyone, including Americans, to, do, to not to spend your business lives in such a way that you don't have anything to do with emerging markets. Life is too short, you only live once, and emerging markets are called uh, such for a reason. They are em emerging, and the opportunities there, you can feel them in the air. Every time I go to Delhi, for example, uh, I feel like I'm in Moscow again. They're very similar to each other. The problems are similar, the opportunities are similar, and you know, here you're just one of the guys. You go there as an Emory MBA, you're, you're a superstar. So like Zaza was telling me, Zaza is a superstar here, but when he, when they had, what was it, a lockout, uh, the negotiation uh, uh, for the, the salaries and all, Zaza took uh, few months off and uh, went back to Istanbul where he played in the past and I think he played with one hand in, <laughs> <laughs> in Istanbul and so yeah, go to my if there is one thing to remember from this meeting go to emerging markets you will not regret it will be an adventure you'll have a lot of fun and, and see another part of the world please Thank you for the question. Um, I was very nervous about uh, how the kids grow up. And uh, in modern times, we are blessed with phenomenal opportunities that uh, were unthinkable before. I told uh, Dominic Wilkins yesterday that Zaza kindly introduced me to that if someone told me back in Soviet Union that I'd be meeting the guy and shaking his hand. I'd, I'd never believe it. But uh, this era is also very dangerous for kids uh, in terms of the degree of its attack on their conscience and, and psyche. I've seen, for example, the great city of London change in front of my eyes. I've been, go I've been to London a hundred times maybe and I've been going there uh, for 20 years and I remember I'd go out for a dinner in Chelsea with my colleagues and friends and sit and I'd see families, you know, young parents, two kids and talk to each other, have their dinner and now the scene is the same except children's no long, children no longer talk to their parents. They just sit with their faces down into their mobile devices and play. There is no communication between parents and children. 
and they're grumpy and children or parents shyly ask them what they want and they just tell what they want to eat and continue and and it's scary and so Nino and I thought of doing something that would give the kids the opportunity to you know pick the best best things from the modern times but also not be not be suffocated with this modern information age and we've built a school that is different in a way that uh, in, in, instead of having one mandatory program which is academic ed education which any school should have we we've built a program with four mandatory blocks one is academic education of course uh, the other one is um, athletics and sports we have 12 uh, types of sports in, in school um, anything from rugby to, to horseback riding, riding. Uh, then we have something we call moral and uh, spiritual development we come from a very ancient Christian country and we try to give kids uh, you know not force religion upon kids so you don't receive the opposite effect but give them something in small doses you know talk to them about other religions as well and educate them and bring them up in a way that spirituality is not something to be put in the museum and visited once a year but it is a man you know regular part of of life and uh, uh, the fourth block which is my favorite is what we call life skills which is pretty much a lot of manual labor and and <laughs> and kids and kids do uh, but instead of uh, we had labor classes in Soviet Union but you know they were no good I mean you'd just sit and they'd make you make something which had no connection with your life and here we did something completely crazy we we have kids do what they need for example they eat hundred loaves of bread per day at school they bake hundred loaves of bread uh, we have a dairy room where they make cheese cottage cheese yogurt and butter themselves uh, they bring wood from the forest to light fires they uh, wash each other's dishes they clean each other's classes and in those labor teams we have elder uh, uh, classmates working with younger ones and we shuffle the teams every semester so everyone's friends with everyone and we most importantly we force force we obligate parents to take part in those uh, activities so if you want your child to be going to our school you have to come once a month and uh, wipe floors with your son or with a child and you know we get a lot of uh, you know nouveau riches and important people in Georgia but I, I don't I, I don't care I tell them either take your kid out of here and, and so <laughs> or you come wipe floors with me <laughs> and so and so my day starts like this when I'm in Tbilisi I, I wake up and uh, buses come with kids and imagine 130 kids uh, every morning Georgian kids which is a, and, uh, and I just line them up and I talk to them we say good morning then I take them to work out on pull-up bars and girls do something different boys do something different I don't make them do these <laughs> push-ups I can only do them now like this I can only <laughs> that was 20 years ago and and then we say a small prayer before studies uh, for like three minutes breakfast classes lunch after lunch what do you do you can't study you'll fall asleep I always did at Emory you can't do sports so that's when the labor comes in <laughs> After, uh, after, labor, after labor, we take them back to school, we have a beautiful library and they sit and study, do their homework independently. If they don't understand something, they'll raise their hands and ask a question. And then the sport. So we let them go 8-ish, younger kids, 5.30, and uh, they go home for supper. I'm not a big fan of dormitory systems for, uh, for children because I believe that a child has to be with his or her parents in the evening and uh, it's great you know and you get you know you get kids who come they're like junkies they're so used to uh, playing video games and being on their own that we have outbursts of uh, aggression 
at school when they arrive. And then two or three months later, they, they just transform and become Martians like you know, <laughs> the rest of the children. <laughs> Please. Um, you spoke about earlier in your career uh, at Sistema and then taking that time off at a full year with your family. So the battle for balance, how did you balance and did you during that? Battle? Never did. You can never find balance. And, um, it, it, but you always have to want it. We, we're very, how should I say it? You know, like when I start working out uh, and uh, trying to play veterans rugby, uh, because I think it's an important part of my life, I always overdo it and break something. I'll break a shoulder or a bone and be cast for it. But if I don't strive to bring, no matter how old I get, to bring rugby back into my life, I feel like one of the, the pillars upon which my life is balanced is missing. So you have to, you're always out of equilibrium. It's not about being in the equilibrium. Very few people of phenomenal self-discipline and culture can be in it all the time, or at least pretend to be it all the time. It's about knowing where you are vis-a-vis -vis the equilibrium, like a compass. And so if you're away from it, you, you always want to go back. And we are uh, colleagues and uh, sort of students of one of the greatest professions. I've, I've become a very big fan of our profession, which is business, because it combines wonderful things like analysis, numbers, dealing with people, risk, seeing the world. Very few professions give what business, being a businessman or a businesswoman gives to a person. But uh, also, I don't think any other profession has a threat this big. And the threat is to be enslaved uh, in this mentality and sort of... Uh, uh, define your life only in the amount of money and we all suffered from that and we continue to suffer and I, I don't want to I don't mean to stand here as a guy who made uh, uh, some money and stand here and talk about the unimportance of doing it but uh, trust me I my father for example excuse my jumping subject my father has diabetes and the the very heavy form and the fundamental reason why I became a businessman the, oh, the Freudian reason, if you want. it was my father's diabetes. And my naive notion was that, you know, when I have my first million dollars or whatever in the bank, I'll be completely calm and serene about it. I found out, and I say this, I cannot stress this enough, there is no correlation between happiness and money. It's just zero. And I heard of it. Don Keo, I think, told us that. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> he was right. <laughs> he was Once right. you get past your first million. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Please, Jeff. Um, I give a lot of speeches, as you know, uh, to business leaders. And I'm beginning to go beyond the bricks. And I... Obviously, Brazil is going to be big. China and India are big in some ways. Um, I, myself, would be cautious of investing in Russia, either an individual, if there was some opportunity to invest, um, you know, in a, in a direct investment, um, or, or if I'm speaking to CEOs and they say, well, we're mostly in the U.S., then we went to Europe, where should we go next? I would say, well, Russia's got a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, maybe collapsing demographics. Mm -hmm. and, so I, I brought up this beach, uh, uh, Brazil, India, China, and Indonesia, mm -hmm. 250 million people, better demographics. Um, would you, separating yourself, where you, like you say, you built the network, you have the knowledge, you have the confidence, you have the ambition, you understand the system, would you get in front of a group of leaders and say the BRICS is, is what it's all about? Would you say something like Vichy or throw Mexico in there? And would you also say, let's get beyond this thinking about the BRICS. Let's think about the Turkeys and the Colombias, I don't know, maybe Poland or Romania, Argentina, <coughs> South Africa, where, where Mark was from. Give us your kind of global landscape of I was investing money. Sure. 
Um, I, I'll begin a very complex question, and I'll begin um, by disassembling it, perhaps, and say that uh, any one person will make uh, good use out of his or her business career in Afghanistan yeah. uh, if he's talented enough and the other one will achieve nothing in New York mm -hmm. and so uh, the, the primary sort of uh, prism through which we should look at these markets is you know what you know what can I do there yeah. as opposed to having a, a general discussion about the, the whatnots of, the, of those countries. I'm a big fan of Russia because it's always been regarded as a pseudo or a semi-apocalyptic time bomb which, which is about to go up in smoke and it never does and in the meantime creates more billionaires than New York and, and uh, you think about it not to defend Russia but you think about it place has almost no debt the world's um, world's, what is it, third largest cash reserve, it's sitting on almost a trillion dollars by now, and I don't think its hardships are going to come from the economic front, yeah, um, of, I'm a big fan of India, uh, I told my guys that uh, Brazil is surprisingly third largest country in the world in pet population, after China and the US, and Russia, <laughs> Russia is number four. And so when we were approving a long-term budget for the company just a month ago, I told my CEO and board members that when we're done conquering Moscow and great Russian cities, uh, and they said, what, we're going to go public? I said, no, we're going to go to Rio and start opening stores there. And they thought I'm crazy, but I think if we're in shape, we're going to do that. Uh, uh, India and China are very different from each other. China is... Uh, is very, I would say, um, extremely dynamic, but culturally inwards. And in India, you get the sense when, you know, every time I'm there, you get the sense. We had a big business. We invested like $3 billion in India and had one of the biggest cellular companies down there. And because everyone speaks English and, you know, for me, everybody has his own taste. Some people will say, you know, it's the other way around. We prefer China because it's, uh, it's China and India is lazy and laid back and underdeveloped in terms of the, the infrastructure. But um, uh, no matter which uh, emerging market you, you pick, you must have competitive advantages when you go there. Either contacts, know the language. The last thing you want is to just throw yourself at it and then complain about the failure. So you have to be smart about you know, the angle from which you you enter the, you enter the ground. What, Please. What sort of Sorry. relationships do you have to have with the government of Russia in order to be successful? Uh, I know there is a lot of talk about the Russian government and corruption. You hardly ever feel it. I mean, unless you want to uh, be in the gigantic oil fields business, uh, competing with Gazprom and Lukoil. You hardly uh, ever feel it's it's just a generically bureaucratic place, and I never understood why places like Georgia, for example, shed this Soviet bureaucracy at the speed of light, where Russia's flung onto it, and I, and maybe because they were the authors of the system and they have a certain pride in it. And you had a question. Well, the laws of gravity work the same everywhere. So if I let this phone go, I'm going to expect it to go down instead of up. And the same is going to be in Moscow, and the same is going to be in Kiev, and in Tallinn, and in Riga. But of course, there are some fundamental differences in the way you do business in those markets. And there is no mystique about it. Any one of you with your IQs and drive and common sense when you enter these markets, you will understand them very quickly. There is no mystery behind it. In some places, like I, I just told you, bureaucracy is greater. In some places, uh, you know, the uh, capital is much harder to find. In some places, 
competition is cutthroat, but at the end of the day, I'm a big fan of viewing the world as one marketplace. And yeah, there are some anomalies, but you know, I, I've seen brilliant Americans out of New York come and do business better with Russians in Moscow than Russians. And so uh, there, there, we, we, we tend to, and Jeff always helps us to not to do that, but we tend to sort of mystify and glorify this internationalism. But look at me, I grew up here and I hardly spoke any English and I'm standing here as one of your fellow MBAs. If you, if you try to do that in, in China, you know, it will be, be fine. Please. Hi, my name is Amanda Jacobson Hi, Amanda. and I'm from Los Angeles. And Excellent. my question is about passion. And so when you talk about the pet food industry, it doesn't sound like that's your passion. Correct. So kind of <laughs> <laughs> I have nine dogs, though. So. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, I am by now more apathetic towards business, uh, but one thing I've never lost passion in and I think it's still growing in me, is the passion of building organizations. Everyone has his or her own thing. And over the years, I've come to, uh, to realize that this is my thing. Nothing gets me going more than sitting and watching the organization and helping people realign and optimize and minimize conflicts and whatnot. Um, for example, when we were building the school, my initial perception, of course, was I'll write a check, I'll hire a CEO, the, the principal, <laughs> and it's just, I'm going to tell him what to do, and it's just going to do itself. And then I watched the, our principals and teachers uh, work and uh, not do the way at least I thought was proper. And then I said, okay, step aside, let me do this for you. And then I got completely sucked in. And, and I broke my nose a couple of times because building a school turned out to be much more complicated than building a company. It's a much more delicate matter with uh, you know, children and uh, teachers. And, and you may be, I was telling Zaza, you may be walking in the corridor of your school after the morning exercise of children and you know look the wrong way at a geography teacher and cause a problem yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so can uh, as uh, someone with phenomenal level of experience and jeff in academic organizations man it's i don't know how you run these places and, uh, um, and, and, and you have so, parents you have something yeah, well, so you, know, oh, alumni, yeah. you, have so many you are the recipient of bad news. You're the reason of everything that has failed. And yeah. <laughs> everything that goes well with kids is, well, of course, it was supposed to go like this. And you, you had nothing to do with it. And so back to your question. I think your, your passion, you have to, uh, you will always be torn. After you graduate from here, you will always be to torn between what you want to do and what you have to do to make money. And I'm not here to tell you just never do what you want to, what you have to do. You have to do what you have to do to, to make your money. But you know, never betray that, that you know, that far. Because in the long run, you can never be efficient if you don't love what you're doing. Like I had this stupid ambition to be better than George, my partner, yeah. who was a theoretical physicist and uh, is perhaps the best CFO in Moscow and he's my partner now and i had this rugby you know competition spirit with him i always wanted to beat george at financial accounting and broken finance <laughs> it was the stupidest thing i wanted because I, I could never do that but but just just follow you know don't follow your competition with others follow what you really what you're really into and you'll be very successful I, I think I'll make the point that George was also one of my students, and you made the right decision. <laughs> Don't take him on from financial account. But uh, 
He works for you, even though he's a partner. Uh, Marco, if you could stand up for a minute. I'm not putting you on the spot, but if you could just stand up. Um, I think one thing that we take away is that you have to learn a lot and have the mental competence and, and the skill and the plan. But I think one thing you've mentioned to me is the network that you can build here. But you have to form your brain trust, your friends, and which are the, who are the people you really trust. But what I think is great is you and Marco and a guy named Thomas from Germany, none of you kn knew each other, but now you know each other's families and you travel all over the world. And Marco, like I said, was with a very big company, Choice Point. Uh, they had an IP, uh, no, he just, you got bought out by private equity, right? And very yeah, successful. Yeah, and now he's doing extremely well in private equity. And obviously they can learn from each other. Um, I hear they party with each other too. <laughs> The Not as much as we're used to. As you're used to. That's true. <laughs> what I hear. So, so I do want you to think about that too. The friends you want to keep uh, close to you and the people you want to keep far away from you uh, as you develop your, your career. And particularly in your case, it's such an international group that you've built. And I think each of you should try to do that and, and reach out to people uh, very different from yourselves. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to have students such as Marco and Thomas and George uh, but you're the one I invited back to speak. Um, you can come home again, as Thomas Wolf said, and you all can become great successes just if you do. Remember the old professor. Come <laughs> teach my classes for me. <laughs>